Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Huwallazi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa dinil haq liyuzziru ala dini kulhi wa kafa billahi syahida. Asyadu an la ilaha illallah wa asyadu anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasuluh la nabiya ba'dah amma ba'duh. Good morning ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the public lecture of Graduate School of UIN Jakarta with the theme Human Right Council Resolution and the Spirit to Fight Against Intolerance and Violence Based on Religion. I am Taufan Wanafirdaus, I will be your host for today's agenda. First of all, we would like to extend our warmest greeting to the guests of honor for this morning. Vice President of United Nations Human Rights Council, His Excellency Professor Muhammadu M. Oka. Welcome to the Graduate School of UIN Jakarta. Rector of UIN Jakarta, Professor Asep Saifuddin Jahar, MA, PhD. Director of Graduate School of UIN Jakarta, Professor Dr. Zulkifli, MA. Vice Rector, Vice Director, Head of Bureau, Distinguished Guests, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. Thank you for accepting the invitation to be with us here. Thank you for joining the program. Today we are very fortunate to have the Vice President of United Nations to share their thoughts. So let me introduce the Vice President of Human Rights Council and let's give a round of applause for him. Step on to the following agenda. We would like to invite all of us to singing the, the national anthem of the Republic of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise.
And now, please be seated. Excellency, distinguished guests, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite to deliver his speech, Rector of UIN Sharif Hidayatullah, Jakarta, Professor Asep Saibuddin Jahar, MA, PhD. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. His Excellency Professor Muhammadu, Vice President of United Nations Human Rights Council. Thank you very much for your coming to our university. And Prof. I always call Mbak Eni, so I forget Rohaini Juhayatin from president, staff president and all delegates from president staff, our vice rector, Prof. Din Wahid, and also director of school of graduate school and all audience. Thank you very much for your coming and attending this meeting and this public lecture. And also, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude for this uh, public uh, program, especially Bu Rohani Juhayatin, who already facilitated this program. She who already uh, called me to have this meeting in order to uh, welcome our great uh, guests and distinguished guests, Prof. Muhammadu. And of course, I'm as a lecturer, as a rector, State Islamic University, very grateful to have this public lecture. And we hope we can share our knowledge and experience, how about the human rights uh, in terms of tolerance, and also intolerant in Indonesia in the world. So again, I welcome and thank you very much for this program. I will not uh, prolong my speaking, though our time is very tight. So again, I will uh, share and give the opportunity for the moderator to have this meeting. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Rector of UIN Jakarta. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor to have the Vice President of United Nations Human Rights Council, His Excellency Professor Muhammadu M. Oka. And in this session, he will share their, uh, his thoughts to all of us. And in this session, we'll be guided by our moderator, Professor Dr. Siti Rohaini Zuhayatin, MA. So without any further ado, we would like to invite our moderator, Professor Dr. Siti Rohaini Zuhayatin, MA, to lead the discussion. Time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, brother. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Excellency uh, Professor Ahmad Oka and also um, Yang terhormat Bapak Rektor, Bapak Ketua, uh, the, uh, the Director of uh, Postgraduate Studies, uh, UIN Syarif Hidayatullah. So I'm very careful in seeing that because it's usually it's mixed up with Sudan Kalijaga. <laughs> and also the Vice President, uh, uh, Vice Rectors, uh, Deans, and colleagues uh, from uh, UIN uh, Syarif Hidayatullah. Uh, we are very honored this morning uh, to come to this um, uh, university. Uh, Professor uh, Excellency, this is actually one of the oldest Islamic uh, university in Indonesia. One is uh, here in Jakarta, in was, uh, one is in Jogja. Uh, hopefully, next uh, in the next uh, visit, you will be able to also visit uh, Yogyakarta. Yeah. Um, this morning. Um, uh, we are uh, again. We are grateful to uh, have uh, Excellency Professor Ahmadu, uh, Muhammadu uh, as uh, our uh, special guest uh, to the 
international event on bilateral Jakarta bilateral dialogue 2023 in here in Jakarta and uh, uh, of course um, I thought that it would be also very uh, uh, beneficial and also very worth to take the uh, him uh, to visit uh, this campus so um, his visit to Indonesia is related uh, again uh, to our promotion and our um, our advocacy uh, for uh, the implementation of resolutions uh, human rights council uh, united nations human rights council resolution 1618 um, which um, uh, relate uh, to uh, combating intolerance, uh, negative stereotyping, incitement to violence, and violence against person based uh, on religion and faith. So this resolution is very crucial because this resolution uh, is uh, adopted by consensus uh, by the uh, UN member states, including Indonesia. And more than that, that uh, this resolution uh, uh, was uh, in fact uh, uh, promoted by the OIC, uh, Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, which consists of uh, 57 uh, countries, including Indonesia and Gambia, where uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Professor Amadou is coming uh, from. And it is also co-sponsored by uh, United States, so this resolution is very unique because this is co-sponsored between the OIC and the United States. And uh, we hope... Okay. Yeah. And, and we hope that, um, uh, we all, uh, all hope that this resolution will be the bridge at all, or the bridgings um, between uh, our understandings of human rights and um, and in Islam, because uh, this is generally perceived that human rights is from the West. And um, it is why then uh, we are very uh, thankful and very uh, grateful and very hopeful that uh, the presence of uh, Excellency uh, Professor uh, Ahmadu will uh, refresh our pers perspectives in seeing human rights as um, deeply rooted in Islam. So um, we hope that uh, his um, presentation uh, will uh, deepening our understandings that um, when we are talking about uh, uh, UN, <coughs> UN human rights uh, declaration, uh, declaration and convention and mechanism, this is not from the West. This is from United Nations where uh, Indonesia is the member, Gambia is the member, Saudi Arabia is the member. Uh, and uh, of course, his visit is very important because um, OIN is the central, uh, is the core institution that, um, uh, uh, that uh, has the very instrumental roles in our society uh, in um, uh, nurturing the understandings of, uh, of Islam. Uh, realizing that uh, in the recent uh, years we experienced also the polarizations and the instrumentalization of uh, uh, religious identity which potentially divides our society. So we hope that uh, his visit and his uh, speech and the presentation will give uh, uh, um, their uh, new perspective understandings and we as uh, the member of society and also the leaders of the society will also convey this to the IU community. So I think um, this is my um, very short remarks um, preceding the uh, presentations uh, of uh, Professor, Excellency Professor uh, Amaduko uh, Oka. So thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you Professor Dr. Siti Rohaini Zuhayatin MA for your Welcome speech and now we would like to invite Mrs. Mutiara Pertiwi PSD. This is your time to lead the discussion for this public lecture. Please welcome Ibu Mutiara Pertiwi PSD.
Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Pak Taufan. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya iwa mursalin Wa ala alihi wasabi ajmain amma ba'du Good morning and welcome everyone Thank you for joining us uh, I've been here since the morning and get very uh, energetic and positive vibes from the audience Listening to Pak Fuad's uh, presentation And I think that that, uh, that lecture uh, gave us a good setup for our discussion uh, this session My name is Mutia I'm an academic member of Faculty of Social and Political Sciences UIN Jakarta, and I will be your chair uh, of this uh, seminar. Uh, first, uh, let me start this session with uh, some expressions of uh, gratitude. We are honored to have among us Rector of UIN Jakarta, Professor Asep Saifuddin Jahar, MA, PhD, and also the Director of um, Graduate School UIN Jakarta, uh, Professor Zulkifli, uh, Professor Dr. Zulkifli, MA, um, also Vice Director and Chairs of, uh, sorry, Vice Rector and also Vice, uh, Vice uh, Director of Graduate School, Chairs of Master and Doctoral Degree Programs of Graduate School. Thank you for convening this event. Um, and also, of course, our honorable uh, chief guest, um, His Excellency Ambassador Professor Muhammadu. Uh, MOK, uh, the Vice President of United Nations U Human Rights Council. Um, we are very honored by your visit, sir, and uh, sharing this uh, stage with you. It's, it's a very privilege for us. And um, colleagues, uh, also delegates from uh, President, uh, in Indonesian President's Office and also Ministry of Foreign Affairs, colleagues, students, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, a little bit uh, background about this e event and the topic that we're going to discuss today. Last week on the 22nd of August, uh, the world observed International Day commemorating the victims of acts of violence based on religion or belief. Freedom, or, freedom of religion or belief is human rights recognized by the Charter of the United Nations and also international treaties. However, we notice that the violation of religious freedom, particularly in the form of harassment, even in the form of oppression against religious minority groups are still normalized in many societies, including ours. And the offenders are often shielded with impunity, as in many cases, both states and non-state actors take part in perpetrating such action. Today, we are honored. And so as uh, Patofan said, we are very fortunate today to have His Excellency Professor Muhammadu M. O. Ka today to help us understand better this issue, particularly from the perspective of global governance, looking into the extent to which the UN Human Rights Council resolutions have carried forward the spirit to fight against intolerance and violence based on religion. Um, allow me to briefly share Professor Ka's impressive background. His Excellency Ambassador Professor Ka has a long and distinguished diplomatic career. He is the Ambassador of the Republic of the Gambia to the Swiss Confederation and is a permanent representative to the UN Office and WTO and other international organizations at Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Ka has served several prominent positions in different international organizations, universities, and business communities. And currently, Professor Ka is the chairman of the Africa Group of Ambassadors in Geneva, and also the vice president representing Africa for the United Nations Human Rights Council, which is why we are in a such privilege today to have him as a speaker today on the topic of Human Rights Council Resolutions and the Spirit to Fight Against Intolerance and Violence Based on Religion. His Excellency Professor Ka will deliver his presentations maybe uh, for 30 and or 40 minutes, if, if <laughs> you're convenient, sir. And then we will proceed with Q&A uh, session. So without further, further ado, uh, with, uh, with great honor and pleasure, Professor Ka, the time and place is yours. 
Uh, you may, whatever convenience you have. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah Inna alhamdulillah Nahmuduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'khfiru wa na'unzu billahi min sururi anfusina wa min sayyiyati amalina Man yadillahu falamudillala wa man yudilla falahadiyala Respected brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum and good morning. I extend my profound gratitude to the Rector, Professor Asep Sipuddin Jahir, and the leadership of the university and your learning community for your kindness and thoughtfulness to extend an invitation to my humble self to deliver a university public lecture. I am delighted and honored to be here at the State Islamic University here at Jakarta. I also convey my appreciation to my sister, Professor Siti Rouhani, and the leadership and team of organizers of the recently held conference here at Jakarta on the team strengthening the culture of tolerance by mainstreaming the United Nations Human Rights Council Resolution 1618. Perhaps some of you were um, at the event the past two days. It was quite illuminating, insightful, and enlightening, and timely. I must thank again my sister for the foresight and for the thoughtfulness of the leadership of this country for putting such an important event and I hope there will be many, many more to further enlighten our collective humanity. Let me also take the opportunity to convey greetings from His Excellency, the President of the Gambia, Mr. Adam Abaro, the peoples and government of the Republic of the Gambia, and my brothers and sisters at our embassy to Switzerland and the permanent mission of the United Nations organizations in Geneva, and my colleagues, the president of the United Nations Human Rights Council, and my other colleague, vice presidents from other regions. I'm deeply honored to sit before you on this distinguished occasion to share some thoughts, very modest perspectives on a topic that I decided to disrupt a little bit since we've been talking about Resolution 1618. But I thought yesterday night that I will put some thoughts on what I call standing for human rights in everyday life, which embodies the implementation of the resolution 1618, which is a collective responsibility for all of us. It's a very important resolution. So therefore, I decided that I will engage you on a journey on what it means to stand for human rights in our everyday lives. Brothers and sisters, we must stand up for the promotion and protection 
of human rights across the world. As we are all aware, human rights are the basic rights and freedoms that are entitled to every person regardless of their race, gender, religion, or nationality. These rights include the rights to life, liberty, and security of persons, the right to education, work, and healthcare, and the right to freedom of expression, association, and religion, among others. Unfortunately, human rights are often violated in various ways, including discrimination, abuse, and exploitation. For example, individuals may face discrimination based on their race, gender, religious, or political affiliation leading to unequal treatment and opportunities. They may also be subjected to physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, or be exploited for the labor or resources. So standing up for human rights as the topic of my discussion entails is an essential responsibility for everyone as it ensures that all individuals, wherever they may be, and whatever their situation, are treated with dignity and respect. This issue is particularly important in everyday life, as human rights violations can occur in various settings, including schools, universities, workplaces, and communities. Standing for human rights in everyday life, therefore, is crucial to creating a more equal and just society. It means actively speaking out against discrimination and injustice and taking action to support marginalized groups. This can involve challenging harmful policies and practices, supporting social movements and advocating for your rights and the rights of others. It also means recognizing and acknowledging your own privileges and using them to amplify the voices of those who are often silenced. It is important that we all do our part to defend human rights and ensure that everyone is treated with respect and equality. We cannot remain silent when human rights are being violated. It is our duty to stand up and speak out against injustice and to walk towards a world where every person is treated with dignity and respect. Individuals like you and I have a responsibility to stand up for human rights in our everyday lives. This can be as simple as speaking out against discriminatory or abusive behaviors or taking action to support marginalized groups. This responsibility is equally extended to states as they also have a role to play in standing up for human rights. As aptly said, by a non-Muslim, late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Most of you know who he is, a prominent global figure of faith. And I quote, if you are neutral in situation of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Quoted, governments should ensure that all citizens have access to basic human rights, such as education, healthcare, and fair treatment under the law. States should also work to address and prevent human rights abuses within their borders and hold perpetrators accountable for their actions. 
This speaks to Resolution 1618. One way individuals and states can work together to stand up for human rights is through advocacy and activism and supporting organizations that work to promote human rights. Ultimately, standing up for human rights requires a commitment to justice and equality for all people, regardless of their backgrounds or circumstances. By working together, individuals and states can create a more just and equitable society for all. Recognizing the importance of standing up for human rights by all, we can individually stand up for the rights of others by doing very simple things. One, educate yourself. What do I mean by that? Learn about human rights and ensures that affect marginalized communities. This can help you understand the challenges that these individuals face and how you can support them. I was hugely fascinated by the work that my sister, Dr. Siti Rohan, is doing with her colleagues on human rights literacy, working with teachers who are going to influence and impact lives to educate so that they can be more enlightened at a very early age. Secondly, speak out. When I say speak out, use your voice to raise awareness about human rights issues and advocate for change. Be the change you want to see. This can include participating in peaceful protests if need be, or demonstrations, writing letters or articles, or using social media, which is increasingly being used in negative ways, but can certainly be used in positive ways to enlighten and to amplify the voices of the marginalized communities. Three, you can also support organizations that are working on these issues, especially organizations that are working towards implementing Resolution 1618. How do you do that? Donate your time or resources, like my sister, Professor City, is donating her time, thinking pedagogically to construct reasonable and practical, innovative ways to reach out to those that shape future generations, which promotes human rights. These organizations often provide legal support, education, and other services to individuals who have experienced human rights violations. Fourthly, stand up for others. If you witness a human rights violation act, this can include intervening if it is safe to do so, or seeking help from authorities or organizations that can provide support by standing up for human rights in everyday life, we can create a tolerant, pluralist, more just, and equal society for all the people. As we gather here at the State Islamic University here at Jakarta, I cannot help but reflect somberly on the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Dr. Siti Rouhani mentioned the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This year is its 75th year. So as I prepare these thoughts, I can't help but reflect upon the journey. This landmark declaration, born from the ashes of a devastating world war, continue to serve as a beacon for humanity. 
it is not for one region of the world or for the North or for Europe or for America. It's for all humanity. It enshrines the fundamental principles of human rights, that is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I say it enshrines the fundamental principles of human rights, justice, and dignity for all. That's in essence the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights. However, despite these noble intentions, we find ourselves grappling with an increasingly polarizing world where divisions and conflicts seem to overshadow our shared humanity. I submit to you for your reflection and consideration that human dignity must be upheld and preserved for everyone regardless of their background, beliefs or origin. Today, I sit here to emphasize that human dignity is not merely an abstract concept or a replacement of human rights. It must be the beating heart of all human rights principles and not a replacement. Our commitment to human rights will be empty, superficial, and a mirage if it does not recognize, respect, and situate its core and inherent dignity of every individual everywhere. As the world eagerly anticipates the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this is an opportune moment for our collective reflection on the fundamental principles that inspired this landmark legal instrument and its universality. Having inspired more than 70 human rights treaties, the, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is arguably the greatest international legal instrument of the last century. However, there is an ongoing debate on whether the concept of human rights is entirely Western and whether non-Western people like us can be expected to embrace Western-based international human rights instruments. This is in the minds of many in the global South. There is brothers and sisters. The concept of human rights is anchored on human dignity as propounded in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The English word dignity comes from the Latin word dingus, which means worthy of esteem and honors due a certain respect of weighty importance. At its basic, the concept of human dignity is the belief that all people hold a special value, all people, all people, hold a special value that is tied solely to their humanity. Whilst human rights is defined as rights and freedoms to which every human being is entitled to. So as I was chatting yesterday with my sister, is not a replacement. I wanted to answer that today. It was motivated by a sideline chat I had with Sister Rohani yesterday. Unfortunately, there is a sweeping generalization on some questions about third world or Afro-Asian antagonism towards human rights. To the contrary, there is brothers and sisters, to the contrary, 
human rights was a huge rallying point for some of us in the global south. From my lenses, for African nationalism and pan-Africanism. Just to put the point that it's not owned by the West, it is rooted in pan-Africanism and African nationalism and in Afro-Asian spheres. In their quest to liberate the African countries from the yoke of colonialism, these movements were effectively engaged in the fight against right abuses and appealed to the international community on the need to respect the rights of African people. So it's not owned by the West. In this regard, a renowned Ghanaian lawyer, SKB Asante, argues that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights provided a powerful source of inspiration for the founding patent of African nations. In the context of African and Islamic perspectives on human dignity, we must acknowledge the rich tapestry of cultural, religious, and philosophical traditions that have long emphasized the sanctity of human life and the dignity of every human being. It is essential that we draw from these values to reinforce the universality of human dignity and apply them in all aspects of human rights advocacy and implementation, including the resolution of 1618. In fact, as far back as August 1977, my country, the Gambia, I am from the Gambia, barely 12 years after its independence from the United Kingdom, displayed bold leadership of the global human rights movement by submitting a memorandum to the Commonwealth Law Ministers' Meeting in Winnipeg, Canada, to create a Commonwealth Human Rights Commission. The memorandum cited the 1971 Declaration of Commonwealth Principles on Individual Rights, Democratic Practices, and Human Dignity and Equality. Thus, the pioneering memorandum sought to combine official declarations of commitments to human rights with an effective mechanism for its promotion and protection within the Commonwealth. The irony, the irony is the Gambian initiative failed to gather the expected support from within the organization, that is the Commonwealth, especially from the old Commonwealth powers that notwithstanding, the Gambia was able to show that an African country and a small state for that matter could take the initiative in striving to expand the human rights cause in innovative ways that Western actors had neither considered nor dared to do before. Which rejects this notion that it's a Western-owned concept or principle. Now, respected brothers and sisters, in my humble view, what is Islam's perspective on human dignity? Let me quickly share some thoughts. The concept of human dignity 
has long been deemed in Islam as the right of every person, regardless of who they are. By simply being, simply being, a person deserves to be respected, to be dignified, and to be given certain rights. Our religion, Islam, as a religion, does not deny the natural instincts and emotions in a human being. It instead teaches us how to manage or overcome them. To overcome this, Islam emphasizes on the commonality of human beings. What is the commonality of human beings? Our humanity. And in Surah Al-Isra, 1770, وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ وَحَمِلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرَّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنْ تَيِّبَاتِ وَفَدَلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى الْكَسِيرِ مِمَّنْ قَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا صدق الله رزم Indeed, we have dignified the children of Adam, carried them on land and sea, granted them good and lawful provisions and privileged them above many of our creatures. According to our Holy Quran researchers, it can be said that this above mentioned verse is the most important explicit verse on human dignity and its derivative, which is human rights. It is important to note that the word honor is used within the phrase descendants of Adam without association with one specific group which signifies the oneness of humanity. In the light of human dignity, it is not through any personal attributes that a person is honored. Rather, it is because of the fact that what? They are humans. According to Al Alusi, 1270-1854, everyone and all members of humanity, including the pious and the sinner, are endowed with dignity, nobility, and honors, which cannot be exclusively expounded and identified. Ibn Abbas, the companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, famed for his Quranic exegesis, has commented, however, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored mankind by endowing him with the faculty of reason. The concept of human dignity in Islam is also seen in a treaty that our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam partook before his prophethood, which is the helpful Fudul, which translates to the League of the Virtues, written up after the mistreatment of a Yemeni merchant. The treaty promised to uphold justice for all <clears throat> who were oppressed in Mecca, regardless of their status and background. During his prophethood, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam still acknowledged the validity and value of the treaty, saying it was more beloved to me than a herd of red camels. And if I were called to it now in the time of Islam, I would respond. Through this treaty, we see Islam following a set of principles and morals that are grounded in practicality and protection of the rights and dignity of people. Dignity is not earned by meritorious conduct. It is an expression of God's favor and grace. Mustafa al-Sibah, 
Al Hassan Al Il also remarked that dignity is a proven right of every human being, regardless of color, race, or religion. Another scholar, Ahmad Yusri, has drawn that dignity is established for every human being as of the moment of birth. Elsewhere, Sayyid Qutb highlighted that dignity is the natural right of every individual and that the children of Adam have been honored not for their personal attributes or status in society, but for the fact that they are human beings. Dignity is therefore the absolute right of everyone and is not a Western creation. It is embedded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Islam has been there before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and human rights cannot be a Western construct, even if they believe that is. Islam has been there before. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been there before. We lived by it. It is our construct. It is our values. Human rights is not something new in our religion and Islam. It's our way of life. And from the Quranic verses, you can see how we are instructed. And if you go to the Hadith, as I give example, and there are many, and I'm sure the scholars here know more than I, there is ample. So anybody who thinks that human rights or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights where human dignity is embedded is a Western creation, no. As I just um, shared with you. Through this treaty, we see Islam following a set of principles and morals that are grounded in practicality and protection of the rights and dignity of people. So dignity is not earned by meritorious conduct. That's the Western construct. Dignity is not earned by meritorious conduct. It is an expression of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor and grace. Mustafa al-Siba and Hassan al-Il also remarked that dignity is a proven right of every human being, regardless of color, race, or religion. Ahmad Yusri has drawn that dignity is established for every human being as of the moment of birth, as I indicated earlier. Other scholars such as Al-Zuhaili noted that dignity is the natural right, which he calls haq tabia of every human being. Islam has upheld it as such and made it a principle of government and a creation of interaction, al-mu'amala. During the conference, this past two days, when we were dealing with the issue of implementing the resolution 1618 and the centrality of constructive dialogue and active listening of responsibility, of respect, it's not very different from this muamala. We must reach out to engage. And Muamala among people. It's not permissible. Our values doesn't allow us to violate the personal dignity of anyone as Muslims. This could not, this cannot be something new. It's been within our religion. It doesn't permit us to violate your personal dignity or my personal dignity, regardless of whether, of whether 
the person is pious or of ill repute, Muslim or non-Muslim, even a criminal is entitled to dignified treatment for punishment. Punishment is meant to be for retribution and reform, not dignity and humiliation. In addition to the references from Quranic texts, references are also drawn from the Hadith, an incident where our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw a funeral procession passing by. Upon seeing it, he rose in respect and remained standing until one of his companions informed him that the diseased person was a Jew. This intervention provoked our beloved prophet to disapprove as he posed the question, was, not, was he not a human being? The prophet, in other words, did not consider the religion or the religious following of the diseased person to have any bearing on his inherent dignity, which called for unqualified respect. Brothers and sisters, what a profound display of meaningful tolerance by our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The dignity of man is manifested in his freedom of conscience moral autonomy and judgment. Our holy book, the Quran, clearly instructs us that overall compulsion violates dignity even in the acceptance or rejection of Islam itself. It tells us, la ikra fi deen. There shall be no compulsion in religion, Al-Baqarah 2 to 56. Invitation to our faith and da'wah must comply with the spirit of sincere advice and dignified persuasion. The Quran has in many places addressed our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by reiterating that his task is confined to warning the giving of advice and guidance, and that he has no authority on people's freedom of choice. The Quran tells us, The truth has come from your Lord. Let him who will believe and let him who will reject. Surah so Al-Khaf. And there are other references. One at law al-Quran, فَمِنْ أَحْتَدَى فَإِنَّمَا يَعْتَدِي لِنَفْسِي وَمَنْ دَلَّ فَقُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُنْزِرِينَ And anyone who accepts guidance does so for his own good, and if he wants to go astray, then tell him that I am only a warner. Al Namla 2792. The messages are repeated in many places in the Holy Quran, appealing for rational choice and judgment of man. These messages delivered to man, reminding us that the messages are meant for those who think and investigate, and those who exercise their reason and consider judgment. Yatafakkarun, yatadabbarun, yanzurun, yatazakkarun, yakhilun, etc., etc., etc. Religious guidance is propagated and expounded, but it may not be enforced by anything other than sound and sincere advice. 
and other manifestation of the dignity of man in Islam is its insistence on the external equality of every member of humanity. All are equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless of race, color, or religion. No man has a claim to superiority over another, and there is no recognition in Islam of a class or caste system, a superior race, a chosen people, or any related concept. Man's inherent dignity is sacrosanct, and the only ground of superiority recognized in the Quran is God consciousness, which is taqwa. And the following ayah buttress this point that I'm sharing with you. Ya ayuhannas, inna qalahnaakum min zakari wal unsa, wa ja'alnaakum su'uban wa khaba'ila li takharafu in akramakum indallah atqaakum innallaha alimul khabir. O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female and made you into tribes and nations so that you may know one another. The most noble of you before God is the most God conscious of you. Surah Al Hujurat 49 13. The essential quality of humanity necessitates equality in human rights, including the right to justice the equal protection of the law, equality in respect of education and employment and enjoyment of basic liberties. So, my dear brothers and sisters, standing up for human rights, religion's role in peace building, perspectives and insights from the Gambia. I will save you that because I don't have much time it seems and let me um, go towards the end of what i'm trying to share as we attain 75th anniversary and reflecting on the topic standing for human rights i cannot help but ask the question what can we do Certainly, we must collectively step up our efforts, commitment, and voices to stand up for human rights for everyone, everywhere. We recognize the positive impact of the United Nations Charter, especially for the Global South, us. The issues of sovereignty, freedom of expression of our people, promoting equality for national development, promoting inclusivity for all vulnerable groups, and yes, leaving no one behind, and the centrality of dignity, human dignity, and human rights. For the United Nations, and especially the Human Rights Council, to be seen to be fair and not to be treating issues selectively. There is also the need and interest for the Global South, us, and for all member states, for United Nations, and by extension, the Human Rights Council, to broaden and prioritize issues relating to economic, cultural, and social rights, most especially as it relates to education, health, environment, food security, and digital. Respected brothers and sisters, the United Nations reaches the 75th. We must accept that misalignment of views, perspectives, perceptions, and understanding among member states is as diverse as the Human Rights Council. The lack of active listening and lack of mindfulness of our diversity and our mindsets and preconceived notions and mistrust remains a challenge. As we attain and appreciate huge impacts and gains on human rights for the past 75 years, these challenges pose bottlenecks and risks to our collective requirements to live up to expectations of the founding fathers of the Charter, universal human rights, and adherence to, to good practices.
what seems to be emerging at this juncture in the 75 years journey of human rights is a widening gap between the global south and the north with each holding on to a different understanding and perspectives of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human rights principles and fundamentals, meanings and understanding of freedom of expression, intolerance, values, human dignity and human rights and differing perceptions of the United Nations Human Rights Council mechanisms and its utility. This must not be the case and it's urgent that we strengthen our engagements anchored and driven by constructive dialogues with appropriate spaces that will facilitate, encourage meaningful and continuous encounters with active listening. In this light, enhancing education, awareness and enlightenment of the principles enshrined in the Charter and Resolution 1618 is imperative. Collaborative efforts among governments, civil society organizations, and educational institutions such as this Islamic university are essential to foster interfaith dialogue, mutual respect, and comprehension among diverse communities. The nurturing of an environment that nurtures tolerance and inclusivity forms a robust foundation for the successful and meaningful implementation of Resolution 1618. In light of Indonesia's prominent role with the Organization of Islamic Conference, it is crucial to consider the perspective of the Organization of Islamic Conference on Resolution 1618. The Organization of Islamic Conference representing 57 member states and over 1.9 billion Muslims globally places high importance on combating religious intolerance and discrimination. The OIC has consistently endorsed the resolution's goals as a means to foster peaceful coexistence among diverse religious communities and to promote understanding between cultures. I cannot leave you without referencing the recent burning of the Holy Quran, which I'm sure it is in the minds of all Muslims. At 75th of the Universal Declaration, it is with a heavy heart that over 1.5 billion Muslims continue to be subjected to intolerance and violation of the UN Resolution 1618 by the continuing burning of the Holy Quran. And capitals of Northern countries with continuing attempts to justify such acts under the cloak of freedom of expression. Let us be clear, true freedom of expression must never be a license for hate, for intolerance, or the destruction of sacred texts, whether it is the Holy Quran or any other. Instead, it should serve as a platform for constructive dialogue, understanding and mutual respect among diverse communities. In the wake of multiple burnings and desecration of copies of the Quran in certain European capitals, including the recent high profile Quran burning in front of a mosque in Sweden and Denmark, allowed by the police, the human rights dimension of issues has attracted the attention of the United Nations Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. Even though 193 General Assembly members adopted a consensus resolution deploring the acts direct against the holy books as a violation of international law. The Human Rights Council, on the other hand, in Geneva, was split in its votes, with Western countries voting against the resolution sponsored by Pakistan on behalf of the OIC on the pretext of freedom of expression of the perpetrators. Muslim leaders around the world have stressed that such desecrations are intended to be provocative and cannot be covered by freedom of expression laws. One of the reasons behind such act as the, as the, as the perpetrators inability to acknowledge differences as if concerns that those who are different from them are seen as threats to their way of life and their interests. 
the decision to incorrectly focus on each other's differences and act upon this irrational and myopic understanding is against the teachings of Islam. One of the ways we can correct these misperceptions is through the emphasis of what Islam teaches through the Quran and Hadith about human dignity that I share. The fundamental lessons to draw from the above example and the vote at the Human Rights Council is that the more human rights appear to be a political battleground than a moral question, the less likely a consensus can be reached to actualize human rights of all peoples, regardless of gender, race, or religious belief. We must acknowledge that freedom of expression, while a fundamental right, is not absolute. It comes with the responsibility to use our words and expressions in a manner that uplifts, unites, and foster understanding rather than perpetuating divisions and hurt. As we strive for open and inclusive societies, let us remember that respect for one and other's beliefs, sacred texts, and places of worship is not a limitation of freedom. Rather, it's a testament of our commitment to human dignity for everyone and everywhere. Let us leave here with a renewed dedication to promoting tolerance and pluralism and human dignity for all transcending borders, cultures, and faiths. Let us continue to engage in meaningful and continuous conversation, dialogues, collaborations that foster empathy, human fraternity, encounters guided by mutual respect, constructive dialogue, understanding, compassion, and conviction. We can build a better world where human dignity is not just a slogan, a rhetoric, or an ideal, but a lived reality, an ethos of every individual, society, everywhere. These recent events, such as the unfortunate burning of the Quran in certain instances, underscores the urgent need for the global community to address acts that fuel religious hatred and incitement. Let me conclude. I have a lot to share with you, but time, time is not in, a, in, in our essence, but I will share the, the detail of, of, of the documents. Let me conclude. Standing up for human rights requires adequate support, readiness, capacity, competence, and the participation of youth and women. An intellectual trust, such as academics and researchers in university circles and platforms, facilitated by learning institutions such as the Islamic University, churches, mosques, synagogues, community, civil society organizations. It will require deepening our faith and providing meaningful mentorship anchored on enlightenment of human rights of values, positive attitude and mindset, commitment to services, kindness, hope, love, and happiness is core to facilitating the role of religion to building peace and sustaining it, deepening it, and strengthening our collective efforts on firmly standing up for human rights, dignity as a human right, not a substitute, and human rights everywhere and for all. I submit to you religion and the power to inspire, to capture the heart is an ineffable aspect of the human soul that exist across any man-made divisions of class or border. Its power to unite us in human fraternity through a powerful and universally felt love must never be overlooked. Religion has the power to change the world. I further submit that generally religious diplomacy, I'm a diplomat, is vital for effective standing for human rights for all. 
in several significant cases, religious diplomacy has succeeded where state actors and international organizations had failed to bring back peace and communities torn by conflicts. Brothers and sisters, in closing, I want to express my deepest gratitude to each one of you for having the patience for attending and listening to me in this public lecture at your university. Let us carry the spirit of my very modest shared insights and perspectives and carry them forward as part of your continuing reflections, refinement, and improvement. May these humbled shared thoughts facilitate for each one of you to embrace the richness of diversity and the universality of human dignity, significance of human fraternity, commitment to a tolerant society that continuously engage in constructive dialogues and meaningful encounters driven by active listening and ownership. May this modest lecture inspire and reignite your collective efforts and to commit to stand for the universal declaration of human rights and contribute to the diverse efforts towards a more inclusive, harmonious, better, and more to tolerant global community delivering on protection of the human rights and dignity for all everywhere. Thank you once again for inviting me. I'm deeply honored and immensely humbled to engage with the Islamic University's learning community. Inshallah, may our collective efforts lead us to a brighter and more dignified future for all where we always see in our collective efforts and human rights work, let us see only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God bless and reward you all abundantly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum That's a very powerful. Uh, university rector for uh, leaving earlier because he has another agenda and he sent uh, he sent his uh, best wishes for your stay in Jakarta. I hope you enjoy your visit and product, have a productive visit. And um, I will try to uh, sum up and um, highlight some key takeaways from uh, Professor Ka's uh, presentation. Um, I have a quite long notes, so I hope I can summing up in a coherent way. Uh, but I think uh, Professor Ka began with a very powerful message as well, that it's important to standing for human rights, not only in rhetorics and not only when we are encountering it directly, the issue directly, but also we need to uh, exercise uh, human rights uh, respect in everyday lives. And, uh, he also um, identified some uh, methods to implement that idea is uh, first is to educate ourselves, to speak up and be the change that we want to be. And also we can also uh, support human rights by supporting organization that uh, are doing protection and also advocacy. Um, regarding uh, the relationship or uh, regarding the topic of uh, Islam and uh, human rights, Professor Ka also highlights that uh, the idea of uh, respect to uh, human di dignity does not contradict to our values in Islam. Uh, in Islam, uh, in Holy, the Holy Quran and also uh, the treaties uh, during uh, the Rasulullah time, uh, also uh, already um, resonates respect to uh, human dignity, the equal uh, respect to human dignity, uh, that uh, 
mentioned in many uh, texts that uh, the rights of every person is equal and by simply be and uh, yeah and uh, there is the commonality of uh, human being that we call humanity and um, related to his work with the UN Human Rights Council he also uh, highlighted that um, the Islamic community and particularly the country members of uh, Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation need to respect um, need to respect and act according to the uh, UN resolutions uh, 1618. Um, as uh, the resolution is coherent with uh, Islamic values, with the uh, message of the Holy Qur Quran to respect uh, diversity and against violence based uh, uh, violence based on religion. Uh, and last but not least, he also highlight that. Um, now I cannot read my own notes. <laughs> uh, the sorry, uh, yeah. The religions has to contribute in changing the world to be a better place. I think that's a very, very insightful message, and I think it's very inspiring. Uh, maybe uh, we now uh, move forward to the Q and A session. Uh, I will open the session for three people in the in the first round, and then we'll see if we still have time uh, to have another session. I will collect the question uh, for now and later. Maybe Professor Ka could respond to them uh, at the time. Um, I think it is also acceptable if you would like to ask in Bahasa Indonesia, I can help you to uh, translate it into English for uh, Professor Ka's convenience. Uh, so anyone uh, with questions, please raise your hands, please. Okay, uh, maybe this, yeah, Ibu Ulfa one, and the one in the back, uh, white hijab, okay, and then, yeah, maybe this one. We hope there will be another round. <laughs> yeah, please, Ibulfa. Yeah, thank. You. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ibu Mutia, moderator. My Excellency to the Director of Paskasarjana in Jakarta, and my Excellency to Professor Muhammadu. Uh, Vice President of United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, it is actually a simple question. <laughs> yeah. My name is Ulfa Andayani. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, student. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in recent years, uh, human rights violation still uh, occur, mostly among Muslim uh, minorities. Uh, such as in India, we know that authorities uh, discriminate against uh, Muslim and also uh, Muslim Uyghur and uh, Rohingya and other Muslim minorities. Um, of course, United Nations has uh, made uh, the solution to this uh, situation and the problem happened uh, in the world. Uh, but beside the resolution, uh, uh, to judge uh, that the violence as the crime um, and the dialogue, uh, what is uh, the, de the decision of policy uh, as the concrete action to solve this problem? Is there any other uh, policy such as programs uh, conducted by uh, Human Rights Council to campaign anti-Muslim hatred and accepting Islam as a religion for uh, so, uh, word peace. Thank you. Maybe the next question after this. Please introduce yourself first. Uh, I think the one, the lady at the back. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Introduce myself. My name is Anissa Lukharia. I student of master program, graduate school in Sharif Hidratullah, Jakarta. In my opinion, the issue of intolerance is a warm to discuss. Considerably that my thesis uh, also discuss uh, marginalized 
group in Indonesia called by Shia. As long as I research the group, I try to, in, to enter and be the part of its group. I also share my activities with the group in on my social media. But the lot of many friends, even they are academic person, they respond real, really surprise me. Someone even blocked my social media. I I think I try to be a changer of mindset. That uh, I've tried to be changer mindset. A uh, part uh, menurut saya. Uh, mohon maaf saya bahasa Indonesia susah sekali. Ngomong <laughs> bahasa Inggrisnya. Jadi begini. Uh, pada dasarnya kita hidup di dalam kelompok yang mayoritas, di mana mayoritas ini selalu menindas yang minoritas. Seperti di Indonesia ini kelompok yang mayoritas adalah Sunni. Dan itu men, uh, menurut saya masih banyak sekali perlakuan-perlakuan intoleransi terhadap kelompok minoritas. Seperti kelompok yang sedang saya teliti, yakni kelompok Syiah yang ada di Indonesia. Dan menurut saya pattern ini itu terjadi dimanapun bahwa kelompok mayoritas akan selalu um, menindas yang minoritas. Tadi saya mencoba untuk menjadi seorang uh, changer. Seperti yang katanya Prof. Muhammadu tadi untuk menjadi seorang pengubah gitu kan. Cuman ternyata menurut saya itu tetap sama saja gitu dengan adanya pattern yang seperti ini dimanapun gitu. Bagaimana menurut Prof. terhadap keadaan yang demikian. Apakah kita seorang pengubah yang hanya segelintir ini bisa mengubah kebanyakan orang? Gitu. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you. I will try to translate the questions for for, for uh, professor. Uh, so the question was asking about uh, how to um, how to respond to the a lot of intolerant um, manners in around us in everyday lives. Uh, In Indonesia, we, uh, for example, we um, encounter cases the um, discrimination against Shia Muslim, uh, and Prof. Zulkifli here is the expert of Shia Muslim. Um, and I, I also believe in uh, in your country, in Gambia, uh, there is a Ahmadiyya community is also considered as the minority. Uh, group of Muslim, which is also in uh, our country here in Indonesia, they face also a lot of uh, discrimination uh, issue. And uh, the question of uh, our student is that uh, how, to, how to, as an individual and as a nobody, how to respond to this kind of um, injustice, this kind of discrimination when we see it in during our everyday life and how can we still contribute to change? Yeah, maybe that's the second question. We still have one more question to go. So yeah, the last question for this round, please introduce yourself first. Yeah, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Muhammad Amin. I am from a new student in doctoral program. in postgraduate study in UIN Syarifah Jakarta. Uh, my question is uh, one of the issue that uh, related with uh, human right uh, that happened in Indonesia in Indonesia and also happened in FIFA World Cup 2022 is LGBT I think that. Uh, my question is uh, what the United Nations Human Rights Council view perspective of or principle about this issue LGBT and its rejection um, uh, and in related to the Quranic verses that strictly prohibited this such a behavior uh, as Allah said at Al-A'raf verse number 81 innakum uh, lata'tuna rijala shahwatan min dunin nisa and what to what should we do as a student uh, to deal with this problem to deal with these issues And uh, in other hand, there is uh, some verses and some uh, prophet uh, tradition that also indicate that the respect must be given to the right person as indicate from the hadith, from the tradition that prophet want, do not want to pray for his 
uh, sahabah who have adapt. Uh, maybe uh, Bu Mutia can explain about this to Prof. Kah. And uh, and in other verses, Allah also prohibited the Prophet to uh, pray to the hypocrite people. Walatusolli ala ahadim minhum mata abada. I think that's uh, the question. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum. Okay, that's the last question for this Q and first Q and A uh, round. Uh, Professor Ka, uh, please uh, respond. Sir. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for for your questions. Um, these are not very easy questions to answer um, because these are at the heart of context culture, beliefs, values that are not uniform around the world. Uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council is consist of member states. So it's not an abstract concept. Member states, countries are elected to be on the council. For example, in Africa, you have 13 countries. And then in other regions, you have X number of countries. The Human Rights Council have mechanisms. It has a bureau, and then the council is governed by work, evidence-based work. And then member states are also subjected to self-evaluation of human rights situation and violations in their countries. And these reports are shared and other countries is a peer reviewed. As graduate students, if you write a paper, you send it around and people review it and then it is rejected or accepted. So you have a similar procedure. So the two key procedures we have is, we have a special procedures where people apply, experts who apply, and they go to countries where these countries will, you have minority groups, you have people whose rights have been violated, they will write and complain. And then people who are appointed uh, to go to these countries and investigate. So we call them special procedures. These special procedures have independent experts who are independent. They are experts that goes to these countries and do an investigation, interview people, and then write a report and bring it to the Human Rights Council. And if the report is overwhelming, other members of the council can, can subject these countries into certain sanctions. And countries don't like that. So there is a mechanism in place that is governed by these special repertoires where you have an independent expert, you have a working group, you have an investigative mechanisms. The challenge we have is some of the countries that have rights being violated, whether it is Ahmadi Muslims or minorities, it is member states that will bring this the countries that these perpetuation exist sometimes do not cooperate with the mechanisms of the Human Rights Council, which they have signed up for. And quite a number of the countries will claim sovereignty, that it is not the business of the United Nations Human Rights Council to do something about claims of violations in their countries. And each country, each member state have a national human rights independent institute or center that often tend to have frictions between the governments because their role is they're not a government agency, they are independent and that is where people whose rights violation go to complain and they will do their own independent investigations in the country. The problem or the challenge is when these matters come in to the council, the countries where these things are happening rejects it. 
they don't accept these violations. They will say that it is uh, the media, they will say sometimes that it is politically motivated, etc. Because mostly the countries of the North will bring these matters for debate. And then they are subjected to a vote and the country will be put into a certain procedural sanction by the Human Rights Council. So there are things that at the human rights at the UN level that are continuously to be done. But at the individual level, it is the responsibility of the states to ensure that what they have signed up for, which is to protect all human rights of everyone and everywhere. So the, the difficulty is when it is happening within the bounds of a country, it is very difficult. At your level and your neighbor level, that was why we said tolerance is very important because this, the resolution, the resolution 1618 protects all of the challenges that you are facing. So the UN have done its job is a challenge of implementation and enforcement, which is a human and a state problem. So until and unless there is education, there is enlightenment, there is commitment of member states to protect everyone within their sovereign bounds. Also, religious tolerance at the community and individual levels. We have to, all of us, be tolerant of other people's faith and belief that may be different from your beliefs. And as we were saying, I think it was in the bus, once you get into the why issue, then it becomes very complicated. So there is a lot of work that we need to do individually. If you recall, I said, be the change that you want to see. And sometimes it's lack of, lack of education, ignorance and distant, the more you engage, the more you have a constructive dialogue, the more you have encounters with people who don't believe what you believe. You will discover that there is more in common than the differences. So we have to embrace our diversity and our difference. And for us Muslims, I have quoted several Quranic verses, I don't, it's not me who made it up. God creates us to be different and we have to respect each other. So um, it's not a very clear answer because the Human Rights Council is not, a, is not an, a, a police. It can only enforce things at the council by putting countries into certain categories. And these are driven by the special mechanisms that are in place where, where these investigators, these special rapporteurs go to these countries. Another difficulty, some of the countries will reject the special mandate, the special mandate holders. And they will say that we are not going to allow these mandate holders to come to our country to investigate. Or when they agree, they don't cooperate, which makes their work very difficult. We have the case of the Rohingya. You mentioned the Rohingya in Myanmar. It is my country that took the lead to bring their issue in the General Assembly and in the Human Rights Council. So member states have a responsibility all of us, member states and individuals, wherever we see a violation of human rights, to do what? To educate ourselves, to speak up. The Gambia spoke, not only spoke, but got up to do something about the Rohingya. We took them to the ICJ. We took them to court. We want the global community and the international law to apply on the violations of the Rohingya crisis as minority groups. 
And the last case was a few months ago where it was ruled in favor of the Gambia to proceed to the next stage of prosecution. Gambia is a very small country with very limited resources, but our principles and values of the importance of protecting human rights for all and enforcing resolution 1618 to ensure that even if we are different, even if we don't believe in the same thing, we all have a responsibility to protect the right of those people to worship freedom of religion. We signed, we signed up for it. So if all member states at the country level keep each other in check to ensure that we tolerate and we don't violate and we adhere to the dignity of people, we will have less challenges. The Rohingya crisis is very unfortunate and the world is not doing what it is supposed to do to ensure that we put an end to it. The Gambia is not very different from uh, Indonesia in terms of advocating for tolerance and freedom of worship and belief. We have Ahmadi Muslims in the Gambia and they are protected. We have Christians, different domination of Christians. Is a, is a dominant Muslim country. We are 90% Muslims, but we live in peace and harmony. During their religious celebration, there are uh, members of our faith who believe that we shouldn't talk to anybody who doesn't subscribe to our faith, that talking to them is evil. We don't subscribe to that. There are hadiths and many instances where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam engage constructively and have encounters with Jews and Christians. One of, the, one of the narrations is when a group of Christians came to Masjid al-Nabawi and they were allowed to be in the mosque and some people complained to ask them out, he says no. So individually we have a responsibility. At the community level we have a responsibility. At the state level we have a responsibility. And we all, we all have to communicate, have to engage in dialogue, have to have encounters with the other, have to learn and understand the differences we have with others and respect it. And if you are violated at the personal level, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Reach out to support groups. There are Muslims and other faiths or other denominations within our faith who have tolerance, who will not treat you otherwise. So I hope that makes sense, but it's not a very simple answer. It's a very complicated answer. And the Human Rights Council is not an army or a police. It has mechanisms and it is a member-driven organizations. The other point that was raised is one of the biggest challenges we have in the Human Rights Council, which is the LGBTQ. All members of the OIC, Indonesia and the Gambia, have issues to accept resolutions on LGBTQ. But we cannot stop other countries who have different values, even if they are corrupted values that our religion doesn't accept. We are very limited in what we can do to stop them from advocating for LGBTQs. What we can do is when they come to the Human Rights Council to ask for support to vote, to make it a unanimous resolution like 1618, we, members of the OIC and non-members of the OIC, whose values are not what 
that community believes in vote no. The challenge we have is not only at the Human Rights Council, but when this advocacy comes to member states and ask them to legislate it and make it a requirement and a condition for economic engagement. This is the trend that is happening. So there is no clear answer because these are different values that others have. We, it is very clear what our religion said about these things. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says we have to protect humanity, lives. The question is, as communities in today's world, are we going to kill them? Are we going to deny them uh, their right to live, their right for medical health, their right to education? Do we protect them from being harmed? It doesn't mean you believe in what they are propagating. But does it mean that we have to take their lives? This is a question that we are increasingly being faced. But we Muslims have to be mindful that there is an assault on family values. We have to be mindful that we protect the values that have cultural and religious context and anchored in our community. It's a futile exercise if you engage in a debate of a community that believes in something that in their own jurisdiction, it is legislated as a law. We can be as angry as we can, but we cannot govern what is happening in their countries to reject it. What we can do is when they come to our country to force it on us, and it is at odds with our culture and our legal mechanisms, we say no. We say no. But they are human beings and their lives cannot be taken by anybody. That will be intolerance. That will not be Islam to kill somebody because you don't subscribe to what they believe. It's a challenge. Our, our scriptures are very clear, but others don't. The other perspective is, even in the countries that LGBTQ is, is a normal way of life, it is portrayed as if everybody in that country agrees to that. That's not true. Even in those countries, you have non-Muslims who are Christians or other faiths who are conservative and do not support it. And depending on the politics of the day or the configuration of the Supreme Court, the tolerance level is reflected. But these are very, very sensitive and difficult issues, and they are not going away. That's the reality. It is here to stay. And it's not the first time. This has been happening, if we go to our scriptures, thousands and thousands of years. So let's protect our values. Let's educate our children. Let's educate our communities to protect the values and what our religion says about these. Those who believe in that, let them believe in that. Let us believe in what we believe and let no one change our beliefs. So I'm not sure my answer is helpful, but it, you can see that we are, we are struggling with it and is one of the biggest challenges we have whenever the Human Rights Council is coming. They call it the SOGI resolution. 
and the proponents and advocates do not shy away from engaging member countries to support the resolution. Lots of pressure that we have, but we have to hold on to our values and our principles. And personally, I say, you believe what you believe, you leave us believe on what we believe. But we also believe that all lives matters. And every human being's lives is worth protecting. What was the other one? Is it what was the other? Am I missing? I think so. Uh, yeah. I've dealt with the Rohingya, the challenging LGBT uh, question, and um, the minority uh, faith base. Um, we believe in resolution, the UN resolution 1618, that protects freedom of religion and expression. We believe in that. And we believe in tolerance. We believe that the way we can reduce the challenges that you mentioned is through constructive dialogue, through education, through enlightenment, through engagement. And reach out if, if you are targeted. There are many support groups that can help you. But let's educate others to understand. On the Rohingya, the Gambia is doing its best. We're taking them to court and we are not stopping. And we are asking all Muslim countries to support the Gambia's efforts to protect the rights and the violations of the Rohingya to stop and to keep account to Myanmar. If you go to the archives of the UNHRC, you will hear, you will see some of my statements on the Myanmar items when it comes to the Human Rights Council. On the LGBTQ, as I said, is a very sensitive matter. The countries of the North have a different perspective of it. And that is not going to change. We cannot change those perspectives. But they are committed to push it on every council to have a resolution and ask for a vote. And those of us who don't subscribe to it do not vote for the resolution. And the OIC has a position on this because Islam has a position on this. Are we going to trouble ourselves to say that we are going to change what is happening in countries whose, who not all of them believe in it, but the majority believes in it and the state believe in it? We can't do anything about that. The Human Rights Council cannot do anything about stopping people from advocating their interests. What is our interest? And are we bringing our interests as Muslims and by putting resolutions, you as students and emerging scholars, are you doing writings, research papers to advocate Islam's position on these matters that are sensitive? Are we mindful to be alert on what is coming into the curriculum for young people? OK? Thank you for the responses, uh, His Excellency Professor Ka. Uh, I personally, I personally would like to uh, convey my greatest appreciation and also admiration for what you have done with the Rohingya crisis and also to your country. Jadi, uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian, uh, ada satu negara. Kalau uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian pernah mendengar bahwa uh, di International Court of Justice uh, ada uh, apa uh, kasus uh, persekusi terhadap Rohingya itu sedang diselidiki untuk uh, apa kemungkinannya uh, dalam kategori genosida, 
Nah, yang melakukan tuntutan itu uh, itu adalah Gambia versus Myanmar. Dan di belakang uh, di belakang uh, effort itu, di belakang upaya itu adalah uh, ada uh, upaya dari uh, Ambassador Professor Ka di sini. So it's it's our great honor, sir. Uh, Yeah, I just I just told them that uh, uh, the International Court of Justice uh, processing Myanmar uh, with the allegation of genocide under the uh, the case brought by uh, Gambia, and you are taking part uh, in that uh, in that uh, effort to uh, promote justice for uh, Rohingya Muslims. So, very thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank It's you so much. It's an honor to be here with you. Thank you. I think it 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 goes back to my submission to you that human rights is a collective responsibility and it's not my way and no other way it's a give and take there is no perfection in the world not everybody in the world are one fate and we have to respect these diversities and differences and not engage in and intolerance of it even if we don't agree we have to learn to agree to to disagree we have to educate ourselves on these differences whether it is the rohingya if gambia fold its hand and we are watching our brothers and sisters in myanmar being murdered their rights being violated children elderly moved out of and ripped off their heritage and culture and we could quite that is not muslims that is not what our religion tells us so it is our collective responsibility that is at the myanmar level but even at your community level if there is a minority community who you don't share the same fate, whose rights are violated. Don't sit down and look the other way. Don't sit down and look the other way. We have to learn to be tolerant. We have to learn that these diversities are not your creation. And is not your business or your job to go and violate those people's rights because you don't believe or you don't subscribe to what they believe in. The world is a very complicated world. And you can just see it. Somebody went and just born our Quran. Are you going to respond by going and taking the Bible or the Torah and burn it too. What good is that going to be? Who has a problem? The person who is doing that. Who has a problem? Those who are supporting that person. Freedom of expression is not a carte blanche to violate other people's rights or to incite violence or to disrespect. And if we see somebody planning to burn a place of worship that is not ours, and we can do something about it, we must do something about it. Okay? Okay, I know a lot of you still have some more questions, but unfortunately the time doesn't permit uh, for another session. So I think that's a wrap. Ladies and gentlemen, please join hands one more time for Professor Ka for his insightful and generous uh, sharing today with us. Uh, maybe just for closing, uh, I would like to thank everyone for the productive discussion and participation. I think we touched uh, some of uh, the most difficult questions in uh, this uh, issue. And uh, once again, uh, thank you uh, to the Graduate School in Jakarta for uh, convening and also organizing this event. Um, I would like to close this session uh, by quoting Professor Ka. 
Um, let's standing, let's stand for human rights in everyday lives and be the change that you want to see. Good afternoon, everyone. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sure. I think uh, I think we still we have will, a little bit yes. ceremonial. Uh, <laughs> we need to do a little bit ceremonial. We will present to you a token of appreciation for the next agenda. Yes, we can going down here. We will present to you as a guest speaker this afternoon from Graduate School of UIN Jakarta. Uh, Bapak Ibu, uh, mohon tetap di tempat. Jadi uh, Profesor K sangat ingin berfoto bersama. Do we need to get closer? Okay, be ready. We will have a photo session. Okay, please stand up. Mohon berdiri, teman-teman, para audiens, silahkan. In count of three. One, two, three. Once again. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. Another pose. One, two, three. Okay, please remain on your position because we will present to you a token of appreciation from Graduate School of UIN Jakarta. We would like to invite Professor Dr. Zulkifli M.A to deliver a token of appreciation to our guest speaker. This is a token of appreciation from Graduate School of State Islamic University, Jakarta. Will be delivered to our guest speaker, Professor Muhammadu M. Oka. We'll continue with the next photo session. Our moderator, let's join with a photo session with the guest speaker and also director of Graduate School of UIN Jakarta. Bapak, <laughs> Bapak Fuad, silakan, Mr. Fuad Jabali, MA. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please round of applause for Professor Muhammadu for the very insightful presentation. And also, thank you very much for Ibu Mutiara Pertiwi PSD for the very dynamic session, Ibu. A round of applause for our moderator.
another photo session. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the very end of this public lecture. Human Rights Council Resolution and the Spirit to Fight Against Intolerance and Violence Based on Religion. On behalf of the community, we would like to extend our warmest gratitude to all of audience. Thank you very much for your nice attention and participation. Let we close our session with reciting Hamdalah all together. Bilahi Taufiq wa Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum.